The tall prairie grasses moved like ocean waves over rolling hills that had been made years before by glaciers during the Ice Age. The only inhabitants of this land were the native animals. White men had not yet touched this land. The only men were Indians. This was Des Moines and indeed Iowa before it had been discovered by adventurers from another continent. In the year 1673, Iowa was discovered. The French explorers Jacques Marquette and Louis Joliet, hoping to map out a new empire for their king, landed in Iowa during the process of exploring the upper Midwest. During their landing in Iowa, Marquette and Joliet visited the local Indians and gave gifts establishing peace with the Indians. Later, when La Salle and Perrault explored the Upper Middle West, it officially became French territory. This area remained under French control until 1762, when along with the territory of Louisiana, it was turned over to Spain. A secret treaty later returned it to France in 1800. Three years later, this territory was purchased by the United States in the Louisiana Purchase. Around this time, the names Iowa and Des Moines evolved. An 1810 map of Lieutenant Zebulon Pike showed a river with the name of the Des Moines River. This was the first time the river had been named. The few white men in the next few years in Iowa were trappers and lead miners. The Black Hawk Purchase later cleared some 400 miles of Iowa along the Mississippi River, that is, from Indian possession. After the title to the land had been gained, Lieutenant Colonel Stephen Watts Kearney and three companies of dragoons were ordered to establish Fort Des Moines No. 1, which they did in the year 1834. In the summer of 1835, Kearney began a 1,100-mile expedition of the Wisconsin Territory and on this journey identified the location that would eventually become the city of Des Moines. On July the 4th, 1838, Iowa became a territory. After the Louisiana Purchase, Iowa had been part of the territories of Louisiana, Missouri, Michigan, and finally Wisconsin with this building in Belmont, Wisconsin, used as the temporary capital of the territory. Robert Lucas became the first governor of Iowa when the first choice for the job refused to serve. Lucas took his sweet time, taking six weeks to get to Iowa. William B. Conway, secretary of the territory, served as governor during this period. Lucas served to the year 1841. When he began office, he chose Burlington to be a temporary capital and the Zion Church served as a capital building. Later in the year 1841, Iowa City got the honor and this building served as the capital building for the territory. In 1839, architectural plans for a new capital building were submitted to the Legislative Assembly of the Iowa Territory. The Capitol building in Iowa City was ready for use in 1842, although not completed, and replaced the temporary structure. Meanwhile, steps were being taken that would establish the beginnings of Des Moines. In 1841, the Des Moines River was surveyed for the War Department by Lieutenant John C. Fremont. Two years later, Captain James Allen established Fort Des Moines No. 2 at the junction of the Raccoon and Des Moines Rivers. Des Moines at that time consisted of barracks, offices, stables, corrals, a storehouse, a guardhouse, cabins, and a hospital. Des Moines by 1846 had a population of 127 which included 23 families by 1847. 
On midnight, October the 11th, 1845, the Indians, for whom Fort Des Moines No. 2 had been established to protect, officially lost their title to the Des Moines River Valley. This was marked by a gunshot from the Indian Agency House, which also served as a signal to impatient settlers. Shortly afterward, on March the 10th, 1846, Fort Des Moines closed down, having served its purpose. What was left was a small community. Iowa was soon to be a state, and counties were being organized. Des Moines ended up in Polk County. In the month of May, 1846, Des Moines became the county seat after an energetic contest with other towns. On December the 28th, 1846, Iowa became a state. In 1850, Des Moines got its first post office, which was built by Hoyt Sherman, who had started in the capacity of postmaster in 1846. In 1849, Des Moines got its first newspaper, the Iowa Star which soon had competition from a rival publication called the Fort Des Moines Gazette. These papers were followed by a host of papers throughout the 19th century. The town had grown enough by 1852 that it could be formally organized as the city of Fort Des Moines and be granted a charter. The Reverend Thompson Bird became the first mayor of Des Moines. In the late 1840s and early 1850s, the legislature was trying to decide where the capital of Iowa should be. Fort Des Moines and Iowa City were in competition with each other as the best possible site. The bill for finding the site gave Des Moines an advantage by having the stipulation that the capital be as near the geographic center of the state as possible. In 1855, Des Moines was finally chosen as the site of the capital. Another controversy arose in choosing the exact location for the capital building itself. A site was finally chosen and a building was built in 1857. The records and files from the old capital were brought in by ox-drawn bobsled that winter. One year later, the original Polk County Courthouse was built. Transportation at this time was very difficult. The main way in and out of Des Moines was by stagecoach over extremely rough trails. When it rained, travel conditions were even worse. The stage needed to be rafted over swollen rivers and had to travel through mud that was sometimes several feet thick and that sometimes hid water-covered bottomless pits. The other form of transportation that developed was the steamboat. Several steamboats attempted the trip from Keokuk. The trips were only tried during high water. The Des Moines Bell and only a few other steamboats successfully made the trip. When the railroad eventually came to Des Moines, its dependability soon put an end to the uncertain steamboat. As Des Moines grew, it gradually became industrialized. It had also gained enough in population to warrant building its first public school at the corner of Ninth and Locust. In 1861, the first shots of the Civil War were fired at Fort Sumter. Des Moines contributed its share of men to the war effort. Des Moines women did their share by taking over the men's positions in businesses. In 1862, Des Moines first felt the shock of the war with the funeral of the first casualties. Burial services for Nathan W. Doty and Theodore G. Weeks were attended by thousands of people. Des Moines was not without visible signs that a war was going on as this picture of a baggage train of the 8th Cavalry shows. In 1865, Des Moines and the nation was relieved by the announcement that General Robert E. Lee had surrendered and that the war was over. 
Shortly afterward, Des Moines was saddened by the news of Abraham Lincoln's assassination. Des Moines soon picked up the pieces. By 1867, Des Moines had its first public library located in rooms in the B.F. Allen Bank building. That same year, Des Moines got its first insurance company, the Equitable Life Insurance Company, the first of its type west of the Mississippi. This was the start of the insurance empire that would grow in Des Moines. Coal was also mined in Des Moines, and the first coal company was organized by Wesley Redhead. In 1881, Des Moines got its first university, Drake University. The university was founded by the Disciples of Christ Church and underwritten by General Francis Marion Drake. It was founded to be open to all without distinction of sex, religion, or race. In 1870, construction for the new Capitol building had begun and by 1884 it was dedicated and by the year 1886 it was officially completed drawing a number of curious onlookers. A permanent site was also secured for the State Fair two miles east of the Capitol. In the later part of the 1880s, Des Moines gained two colleges, Highland Park College in 1889 and Grandview College in 1885. In 1888, the Des Moines streetcar system was electrified, making it only the second such system in the country. The electric trolleys replaced steam-driven ones. My memory goes back to, to streetcars. Electric streetcars running on track with a trolley, a trolley above. And uh, then we went from the, from the streetcar to the trolley bus, which was a bus operated electrically with a trolley above. And then we went to the motorized, such as we have today. Mm -hmm. uh, the streetcars, uh, we, the, the source of power was a plant over on East 4th in Hayes just south of where the freeway bridge goes over the river. There was a, a plant over there that furnished all the power for the uh, street railway system at that time. In 1892, Des Moines was thinking of parks. That year, seven parks were established. Two of these parks were Grandview Park and Greenwood Park, which was originally named Prospect Park. Des Moines gained some more colleges before the century was over. Des Moines University was established with great difficulty and four medical schools were started. The Dr. S.S. Still College was the only medical school to survive. Of all the other colleges, only Grandview College and Drake University survived. Des Moines University and uh, Highland Park College did not last long into the next century even though a merger was attempted. During the 1800s, Des Moines residents did lots of things for entertainment, such as going to the circus. When the circus wasn't in town, they occupied their spare time with such pursuits as going to the park or joining clubs such as this archery club. As the century closed, Des Moines launched a campaign to attract visitors. Celebration named the Senyum Said Carnival was put on to publicize Des Moines as a convention capital and as a summer resort. This, conventions, and the state fair attracted over 300,000 visitors. Improvements to Des Moines continued. One improvement was a piece of machinery to construct streets. Streets were not only built but improved by being paved with brick. As this activity continued, Des Moines continued expanding. Areas such as this location on 28th Street near the Drake University campus were soon annexed. In 1900, the cornerstone was laid for a new library and soon it was ready to move into. In 1901, 
Fort Des Moines No. 3 was built after money was raised to provide one square mile for the government. 1904 began with some excitement, too, when the Capitol building caught on fire. Between 20,000 and 30,000 volumes had to be hastily removed from the library. In 1904, Des Moines was ranked third behind Kansas City, Missouri, and Minneapolis, Minnesota in the vehicle and implement business. The next year, Des Moines attorney Edward R. Mason financed a local mechanic in a venture to produce the world's finest motor car. The mechanic was Fred Dusenberg, and the car was the Mason. Later on, Fred L. Maytag bought the Mason Motor Car Company, and the car was renamed the Maytag. The company was moved to Waterloo, Iowa, then to Detroit, Michigan. As for Dusenberg, he built racing cars with his brother August and later started the automobile company that would manufacture the famous motor car bearing his name. In 1906, Des Moines adopted a new plan for government in response to demands for reform. The plan, which was later adopted by other cities, was the Des Moines Plan. Let's go to the, the Des Moines first started at the forks of the river, and uh, the real, the, the Des Moines was incorporated actually in 1951, and they chartered the government in, in actually uh, 1857, and uh, as form of government is concerned, it was a mayor council type of government. Uh, with elected officials from districts, what we call wards now. And that was the form of government that prevailed from that date, from the, uh, the beginning up until 1907 and 8, along in there. There's this change wanted, and, and finally one proposed. They took a plan that was uh, started in Galveston, Texas and uh, uh, adopted that as, as an, uh, an election was held. We changed the plan somewhat by uh, uh, changing the mode of electing uh, candidates. We, we elected them, the, the Galveston plan, elected them at large, and they were assigned to their various positions after election. We, we proposed our election uh, elected each one for his respective office. Mayor, uh, Streets Commissioner, Parks Commissioner, Finance Commissioner, and and what was the other one? Parks Commissioner. And uh, that was known as the Des Moines Plan it was used, it was adopted. Many, many cities all over the country adopted it. We, we operated under that type of government from, from uh, 1850, from 1908 until 19, uh, about in about 1948. It was about a period of 40 years there. And uh, it was decided that form of government was obsolete and they'd elect, they, the electorate then uh, uh, suggested that we go to a new form of government. And the election was held, and uh, and we decided on on the uh, what we know know now as the uh, city manager plan. That was the true concept. The manager plan was taking was uh, making big inroads in governments all over the country. We elected five candidates at large, and they selected their own uh, mayor, and uh, they operate as a board of directors, and the administration was done by a professional. And uh, I thought, and I think many, many people felt that that was an ideal government, but uh, uh, in a few years, uh, the question of, uh, of geographical representation came up. and. Uh, the League of Women, Women Voters uh, proposed a change in the government that was adopted. The change uh, would divide the city into four wards, 
and an elected mayor, elect a, a councilman from each of the four wards and two at large. And uh, the election, at the election, that form of government carried over the old form. And uh, that's the form that we're operating under now. That we actually had four, four major changes in government. In the commission form of government, we elected our first women. During a period of 12 years, there were three women elected to the Department of Finance. And uh, that was the first time in Des Moines history that women had been elected. They did a very good job. On the ballot with the Des Moines plan was a proposal to build a new city hall, which was soon done. Soon afterward, in 1909, a new auditorium was built. The Flame Proof Coliseum was built to hold 11,000 people and soon was serving the city by housing conventions and various shows. 1911 proved to be a good year for the state fair. Because of the invention of the automobile, more people than ever were able to attend the fair. Because of the increased ease in coming to the fair, the Iowa State Fair eventually became the largest state fair in the world. In 1914, World War I began, and by the year 1917, the United States had become involved with the war. Des Moines supplied its first troops to Camp Dodge in September of that year. By late 1918, the war was over, and Des Moines soon returned to regular business after the problem of employing returning veterans was solved. In 1922, the first issue of Fruit Garden and Home was published. In 1924, it was renamed Better Homes and Gardens. Later, it would become one of the most popular magazines ever published. In 1926, Des Moines gained a new airport near the community of Altoona. In 1927, it was the site of a visit by the famous flyer Charles Lindbergh. In 1928, the Salisbury House was completed. This mansion was imported from England and took five years to construct. Its 42 rooms were filled with art objects and antiques. It was later donated to Drake University and eventually was purchased by the Iowa State Education Association, who used it for their headquarters and opened it also as a museum. In October of 1929, the bottom dropped out of the stock market. Like everywhere else, investors in Des Moines lost money. The effect on Des Moines was not as severe as elsewhere. Nevertheless, hundreds of people were out of work. By 1932, Des Moines had a new airport which replaced the temporary one in Altoona. By 1933, the municipal airport had received an A1A rating from the Federal Aviation Administration, the best rating possible for an airport of its size. In 1939, World War II broke out in Europe with the Nazi invasion of Poland. The United States entered the war two years later. $250,000. In the late 1940s, Des Moines finally built a proper art museum. Before the art center had been built, art galleries had been located on an upper floor in the public library. 
In 1950, the municipal airport gained a new airport terminal. This made it easier to service the commercial airliners. On New Year's Day of 1951, Des Moines received its first taste of that new wonder of television. WOI TV, which was then seen on Channel 4, began broadcasting with one half hour of test pattern. After shows from the Tournament of Roses Parade to Ford Playhouse, WOI signed off at 11 p.m. Later, WHO TV and KRNT TV signed on for the first time in 1954 and 1955. In 1955, the city council decided that something had to be done about rundown buildings near the downtown area. As a result of this, an urban renewal project was started in two years. In 1957, federal approval was gained for a freeway to go through the downtown area. Construction was soon underway. The freeway uh, out west, it went through uh, a reasonably good part of town. Uh, and then as it came closer to downtown and near the river, we got into the lower, lower priced uh, and lower income groups. And uh, some of it was not very good, good property. And uh, we took out a number of schools uh, for the freeway. Longfellow was one of them. And uh, Crocker was another one. And uh, most of it was old. Longfellow School was built in the 90s, and Crocker was built in the late 80s. So they were old buildings. In 1959, the Merle Hay Mall was built. The building of this and other shopping malls reflected the increased size of the suburbs. In 1964, Des Moines got its first zoo. The zoo was set up to be a children's zoo. Part of it was designed so children could actually touch some animals. In 1968, construction began on the new post office. The old post office had grown inadequate for the volume, volume that is, of mail that came to and from Des Moines. Later, the old post office was remodeled and became the Polk County Office Building. In the early 1970s, dramatic changes happened to the Des Moines skyline with the building of the Employers Mutual Building and the Financial Center and the Ruan Building as well. In 1971, the state of Iowa acquired the title to Terrace Hill. This former home of F.M. Hubble was turned into the governor's mansion in the next year. The mansion was built in 1869 by banker B.F. Allen. Later, it was purchased by F.M. Hubble, who had made his money in real estate. The Hubble heirs later gave Terrace Hill to the state. Also in the early 70s, the Des Moines Center of Science and Industry was built after intense fundraising efforts. The center included a planetarium, a thing Des Moines had never had before. In 1970, Living History Farms opened. It was established to be a living museum, showing farms of the past actually farmed using the actual tools and methods. Also included was a farm of the future. In 1975, fundraising efforts were started to build the Civic Center. The KRNT Theater, which had previously been the auditorium for concerts and shows, was in such a poor state of repair that continued use was out of the question. In 1979, the Civic Center opened its doors for the first time. In 1977, ground was broken for a new botanical center. The botanical center finally opened on December the 15th, 1979. 
Amateur gardeners and sightseers now had a place to view plants from all over the world. Tropical plants that were previously too large to be seen in Moines were now in the new botanical center. Well, Des Moines has always been a relatively conservative place, due partly to the kind of industry that has grown up here. Uh, Des Moines is and has been for a long time the center of the uh, insurance industry. We also, Des Moines is also the center of the uh, government. We've got state government, we've got uh, the federal government having offices here. And uh, both the insurance industry and government tend to attract conservative type people. People have made fortunes in the insurance industry by being conservative, by making very calculated conservative investments. Uh, people have also made fortunes in, in real estate. Uh, again, it's, it's a relatively conservative type investment. If you uh, want to make a comparison between Des Moines and another city, I, I would suggest uh, Minneapolis as, as uh, a, a different uh, sort of city, one which is uh, somewhat more dynamic. Uh, it uh, got started around the grain business, the grain trade. And uh, uh, as you are well aware, the grain business is a very volatile business. The price of grain fluctuates from one day to the next, and, and uh, you have people speculating on these uh, price fluctuations. So that uh, great fortunes have been made in Minneapolis by speculating, in, in a sense, gambling on, on grain futures, whereas in Des Moines, uh, the uh, uh, fortunes have been made by essentially not gambling, but by being very, very uh, conservative, very, very calculating in the, the way you invest your money and so on. Uh, and I think that just kind of spills over and you, you, you have this whole sort of conservative uh, attitude towards, towards life, towards investment and uh, everything. Des Moines' history has been one of steady growth. Growth that has been tempered, however, by overly cautious thought and by the local standards of common sense. Adventures in the past have mostly moved away from the city. Fortunately, enough of these adventurous people remain so that Des Moines' present state of development was possible. If Des Moines' future as the surprising place is to be assured, enough of these adventurous people must remain and conservative thought will have to be abandoned. For producer David Thrasher, I'm Chuck Shockley thanking you for joining us.